Hello and uh, welcome to this week's edition of Politics Today. And in this programme today, we shall be discussing the King's speech as the King outlined the legislative programme on behalf of the new Labour administration. And we'll be asking what impact will this have on Christian freedoms in the UK? In this programme today, I'm joined by Tim Dieppe, who is Head of Public Policy at uh, Christian Concern. So welcome back, Tim. And also Derek Mortimer from Prayer for Parliament. So welcome, Derek to the program. Uh, I'll start off with you, Tim. This is the first time that you've been on politics today since the general election. Um, what are your thoughts on the election result uh, and, and particularly the huge majority that Keir Starm and the Labour Party have won and in which they'll be essentially unstoppable when it comes to their legislative agenda? Yes, well, I mean, I was very struck that the, uh, the, the votes they got was less than Corbyn got when he was um, not elected. You know, it was 33% share of the vote. And in fact, on a 6%, 60% turnout, that's only 20% of the electorate who actually voted for Labour. And for them to get in a, a big landslide like that, I mean, it's obviously partly because reform split the vote from Conservatives as well. Um, so, yes, a massive uh, mandate that they've got in terms of actual seats in Parliament. And that means I expect they'll push through a lot of their agenda. And a lot of their agenda, um, sadly, is contrary to our Christian values that we cherish so much. So, yes, I am concerned about where things go from here. And obviously, we're going to talk about the King's Speech in a minute. Absolutely. Uh, Derek, great to see you uh, you. back on politics today. It's good to have you on the programme. Um, Now, you've got a very tough job to do now, haven't you, with Prayer for Parliament? And I'm just going to read out some very disturbing statistics according to my notes here. This is the most secular parliament in Parliament's history, uh, that 40% of newly elected members of Parliament have chose to swear an oath of allegiance on a a secular um, affirmation. And that's a rise from 24% from the previous Parliament. Just, and there's very few born again committed uh, Christians in Parliament. Even under the last government, uh, which was better than this one, Um, we still had opposition. Um, But as we go forward, God has called us to be in the Houses of Parliament and uh, he will make a way. And we believe our God can do the impossible, even if it's a secular government. Absolutely. And of course, you've got your work cut out. So it's so important even more to pray for our leaders and authority as well. Even Keir Starmer refused to swear on the Bible. Can I make one point about scared. Keir Starmer? Keir Starmer's married to a Jewish wife. And every uh, Friday uh, Shabbat meal, they have the, um, the, the uh, prayers and so on. And we pray that God would speak right into that Shabbat meal and touch the Starmer household. Amen. That's a good prayer. <coughs> and um, Tim, um, uh, yeah, last week we had the uh, King's speech where the King outlined the legislative mm. programme mm. of the new uh, Labour government. Um, yes. What are your thoughts on the Labour agenda and their legislative programme? And what do you think it means for Christian freedoms in this country? And what should we look out for? Well, obviously there's a, there's a lot there, Simon, but two things in particular I'd like to highlight in there that we're concerned about. Um, one is... Um, VAT on private schools and the other one is um, a proposed ban on conversion practices. Now let's start with the private schools. Um, There are dozens, hundreds even possibly, of of small private schools, Christian schools um, around the country that run on a shoestring. They're they're trying to make it as affordable as possible for church members of young families uh, to be able to send their children not to a state school where you'll get LGBT indoctrination and all of this kind of stuff, No, but to get a Christian education with Christian values and and the gospel being presented every day and pointing to Jesus every day. And that's what they want for their children. And to have VAT put on those schools will be very, very significantly challenging for them and we may well bankrupt some of them. We've already seen some private schools close because of even the threat of this um, so far. So I'm very concerned about that. We know about dozens of um, new initiatives to set up Christian schools um, around the country. And uh, they're they're struggling to just find enough finance to set up. A lot of volunteer teachers, volunteer staff, and so on. Put VAT on the school as well. It will just be very, very difficult. So we are praying and hoping and and wanting to lobby as well uh, that Labour at least put a a limit, say, if your fees are below this level, then 
you know, where you'll be exempt from VAT and continue to be exempt from VAT as it is. Um, but we'll see. But they seem very set on doing it, as in the King's speech, as, as we said. Absolutely. And the government haven't announced any legislative plans yet. It's just mentioned in the Queen's speech. So I suppose you're Queen, waiting yeah. for the fine detail yeah. to come out before you then yeah. launch uh, an attack against this legislation. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and Derek, um, I mean, we are commanded, aren't we, biblically, uh, by Paul in the New Testament to pray for those in authority that we would have peaceful lives. Um, do you want to remind our viewers again how important it is to pray for our Prime Minister, to pray for our elected members of Parliament, even though this is the most secular Parliament in the history of Parliament? Um, it is true. Uh, the Bible says in more than one place, certainly in Timothy, uh, Paul writes to Timothy and he says about praying for kings and those in authority. Um, yes, we should pray for our leaders and um, sometimes God pulls out, he, he actually puts, lead, puts people in power and we don't know why uh, suddenly we have a secular parliament but he knows what he's doing. He sees the beginning from the end and he knows exactly what he's doing. We pray and we pray and know that our God is in charge. Amen to that. Uh, I do apologise, I said the uh, Queen's speech when it was the King's speech. Um, yeah, very different era, Old very different monarchy, hard. everything else. Um, Tim, uh, there's no exact mention, is there, in the King's speech on abortion, no. um, but show how the government's crime and policy bill could be hijacked by extreme members of Parliament yes, so pushing through uh, kind of their yeah. extreme abortion agenda. Well, that's right, Simon. So in the last government, you had the um, crime and sentencing bill, I think it was, and two amendments were brought forward by Labour MPs uh, to decriminalise abortion. So adding that on, ta attaching an amendment onto that bill uh, that would have decriminalised abortion, at least one of those cases, right up to birth. Um, and therefore, you know, there's, there's no sanctions and possibly no regulation on abortion um, going, you know, and when you take the pills, which are only safe for 10 weeks and so on, um, and how it's administered and all of these kind of things. And, and it would just be a total disregard of the value of unborn human life, um, as if it's just disposable um, right up to birth. Um, shocking. So, um, yes, now there's a crime and pol policing bill, and it's quite likely you'd see these same uh, candidates um, bring in amendments to that bill. We'll see how it goes. Um, that could attempt to decriminalise abortion as well. Now, the reason it didn't get through last time is because an election was called before it got to vote. It was literally just going to be voted on the very next week. And in God's grace, I think, you know, the election was called and no votes happened. And so it didn't get decriminalised. This time, an election's probably not for another five years or something, so that's not going to be the saving grace. Um, I'm looking to Derek's prayers, I think, <laughs> on this one, uh, to see what the saving grace is. You know, or, or maybe there won't be, but, you know, this, it will be very serious and let's see. We have to wait and see what amendments get proposed. Uh, absolutely. Um, I just want to make an observation. I, I obviously discussed this just before we went on air with Keir Starmer and with the new Labour administration. They seem to be very cautious to begin with. They don't seem to be as radical as they proposed in their election <coughs> manifesto. Lots of things were mentioned about this Labour government and what they wanted to do, but it seems he's adopted a more cautious approach. Why don't you think, in terms of his legislation, and we know his stance on assisted suicide, that hasn't been put into legislation, uh, abortion measures haven't been put into, uh, into legislation? They, they, they weren't in the manifesto. Abortion wasn't in the manifesto, and also um, euthanasia or assisted suicide wasn't in the manifesto, but he did promise a vote on it. Um, so what we've got now is in the House of Lords, there's a, all the members of the House of Lords get a chance to propose a private member's bill, their own bill. And uh, one of the members, Lord Faulkner, is proposing an assisted dying bill. And um, this bill came second in the ballot. So there's like a random ballot of all those bills. And he came second, which means that it will definitely get debated in the House of Lords, probably in September, October time. Um, and, uh, and then it's over to the House of Commons to debate it if Parliament allows time. And given that Starmer has said he would allow time, it probably will get into the House of Commons and could well become law. Normally it's very difficult for Prime members' bills to become law, but coming second on the ballot helps. And then if the government supports it, they can. And in this case, it looks like the government will support it. Um, so that will be a challenge because um, we've got, we'll have a serious bill then to um, allow for assisted suicide in this country. 
Yeah. Uh, and Derek, share with us how um, Christian watchmen and women need to be very vigilant regarding this new government. Um, I mean, Tim discussed earlier how the new uh, government's um, crime and uh, law and order bill could be hijacked by the abortionists wanting to tag along to that, add amendments to that, and, and even have a uh, kind of abortion at, at, uh, at the end of term or at birth, um, which would completely rewrite the whole entire rules when it comes to abortion. So share with us how we have to be very, very vigilant when it comes to this government and the legislation they propose in terms of how it impacts on our Christian values and the sanctity of life. Well, the Bible clearly teaches that uh, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. And um, Psalm 139 clearly puts God's perspective. But coming to our government, um, they, there are two ladies, particularly lady MPs, who have pushed on this all the way through the last parliament. And now it looks like they're going to have a free for all. And we just pray. Are we, I know it sounds simple, but um, we, we have to make a stand. And um, uh, we're in a, in a situation where these things are coming at us one after the other. And uh, God's clear in his word. We go with what it, the Bible says and we, say, and we take our stand in prayer. Amen. And um, Tim, I mean, we, we talked about assisted suicide. I think it was back in March that uh, Keir Starmer gave an interview in which he said that he wanted to give a free vote for mm. members of parliament if he won on assisted suicide. There's mm. so much pressure coming from his backbenchers. And of mm. course, we also see media pressure being placed on him. Um, why is it so important for Christians to uh, to really campaign on the sanctity mm. of life uh, and, and why it's dangerous to give the power of life and death into the hands of, uh, of well, doctors and many of those doctors right. won't want to carry out euthanasia against a patient. You're absolutely right Simon, it is dangerous um, because it puts vulnerable people under pressure and people will feel a burden um, and, um, and feel like you know, their duty is to end their lives and, and it's quite shocking that that's been said. In fact Matthew Paris wrote an article in, I think it was the Times recently saying that um, people are saying that you know people will think feel the need to end their lives and so they should. You know, and it, it was such a shocking thing that actually people who previously supported this issue had changed their view because they thought no, that's not really what we want. Surely not. We shouldn't just be saying to people your life is worthless and it's worth ending. And I know you know instances where assisted suicide is legal. Imagine you know, the doctor comes round to your bed every day. And you, you, know, you say, I'm in pain, doctor, could you do something to help? Well, not sure, but you, we can offer you assisted suicide. Imagine being offered that every day when you're in pain and distressed about being ill. You know, and the doctors don't really try to keep you alive. Whereas, you know, come over to this country, their duty is to keep you alive. Euthanasia is not an option. So they try harder. And your trust in the doctors is based on the, the fact that they're trying to keep you alive and not thinking, oh, you're worth, you're, you're worth, your life's not really worth living anymore. You know, really, you ought to end it. I mean, what an awful position to put someone in when they're feeling sick and, and possibly in pain or whatever. And really the answer is good palliative care. And when people have good palliative care, they, they very rarely call for assisted suicide. Um, so, and that's really what we should be providing for people. So I really hope that this does not go through. Uh, and Tim, just share with us what kind of society we're living in, that the sanctity of life, whether it's the start of life or the end of life, is not seen to be worth very much or valued very much in our culture. What does that say about the culture and the society that we're living in today? Well, it really says that we're disrespecting um, God's image in humanity, really, and uh, the sanctity of human life and moving away from Christian values. And if we start to say some people are worth more than other people or some lives are not worth not worth human, not really human and effectively, or not, not as valuable as our lives. Um, that's a very, very dangerous, awful place for society to go in terms of what it will allow um, in future from there on in. And we've seen some of that in the 20th century, and I hope we go nowhere near that happening here in the UK. Absolutely. And um, Derek, uh, Keir Starmer said that uh, he wants to offer a free vote. Now, what he could have done, uh, particularly on assisted suicide, was to put this in his legislative agenda uh, in the King's speech, um, had a three line whip, essentially meaning that every member of parliament would have to vote for this, but instead he's discussing the prospect of having a free vote in the House of Commons. So that means that members of parliament can go with their own 
conscience whether they would vote for something like this or not. What do you make of the fact that he's offered this as a free vote? Is this something to be cherished or is this something to be alarmed about? Well, I, <clears throat> well, I think that uh, the fact that uh, the uh, MPs can take a choice is then up to their own conscience, obviously. And um, I think perhaps it's, he wanted, I think perhaps in coming up to this election, the, this was discussed and he might have gone down the three line whip, but he didn't. And therefore, perhaps that's a little bit better on the prime minister than it could have been, put it that way. It's not good. It's not good at all, but yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, and, and Tim, just, just spell out from us, from your position and that of Christian concern, why Christians have to fight for the position on assisted suicide uh, and, and why people should feel kind of uh, a, a sense of moral outrage because uh, as you were saying earlier with palpative care that so many old people who are old, vulnerable, yeah, have uh, 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 been stop from having food, stop from having water, uh, and many of them starve and dehydrate mm. to death. I mm. mean, that's mm. a horrible death that we're seeing well, in our hospitals. Well, that's a whole other thing that's already happening here in this country, Sam, and, and, and that's very concerning as well, and I'm pleased to see people shining a spotlight on it. But don't just think it's necessarily just old people. Um, Simon as well. In other countries where it's been legalised, the, the um, restrictions gradually get watered down and they allow more and more and more people to um, opt for assisted suicide. And children have been euthanised in some countries um, before. And this idea that, you know, strictly it should be you've only got six months to live, well, it quickly gets watered down in the courts to s six months um, if you didn't have medication. And that means diabetes, for example, would count in some countries. Um, as qualify you for euthanasia if you want it, um, or something, or other conditions like that where you're reliant on medication. Um, you're, you've got nowhere, you could, you could live for many, many years, decades, of course, you know, with, with diabetes. Um, but, um, so it's crazy to say you've only got six months to live, you know, but this is how they get, it gets watered down, and, um, and all sorts of people end up opting for it. And you've had cases in Canada where people have phoned up saying, I really could do with a ramp to my house for a wheelchair, Oh, I'm not sure we can find the funding for that, but we can offer you assisted suicide. You know, or, <laughs> yes, I know it's crazy. You know, that, that's an actual case that happened. Uh, or people who are you know, saying, I'm, I'm short of money, and, you know, I haven't got enough money to really buy the food bills. Oh, I'm really sorry about that. We can offer you assisted suicide. You know, so it's crazy, you know, the, the way in which it puts pressure on people to end their lives and makes people think this is a justifiable right thing to do, um, and even young people as well. Yeah, aren't, aren't we in danger with, with this team of actually invoking the kind of spirit of Nazism? Because the way that Hitler and the Nazi regime treated disabled people or those who were sick or those mm. who didn't fit up to that kind of Aryan kind of master race um, were either eliminated or killed. Aren't we and they on the same... And they called it euthanasia. Yeah, and aren't we really on the same moral... Yeah. And they thought it was that compassionate. That's the, That's the yeah. thing, they thought it was compassionate. Their lives aren't worth living. That's a compassionate thing. It's given euthanasia. You know, <laughs> that's that's the kind of thing. You know, and people are justifying this on the basis of compassion, and it really isn't. It's a backward view of compassion. It's upside down view of compassion. Yeah. Compassion is to care, and to give life, and to you know, provide palliative care, and persuade people that their lives are really valuable and can't just be ended. Shouldn't just be ended in this kind of way. Yeah. Uh, and, and Derek, you know, essential to our Christian beliefs is that sanctity of life that we are as, as Tim rightly said that we are made in the image of God um, whether that's from the unborn or to the elderly it's imperative that we protect life isn't it so it, it would seem that if our government goes ahead even if they have a free vote and we have legislation that that actually helps assisted suicide in this country um, this is a big front to God, isn't it? And this is why we all need to be praying about this situation, maybe even writing to our newly elected members of Parliament on this one to express how important this is as Christians to defend the sanctity of life, whether at the start of life or the end of life. Yes, we are made in the image of God. And uh, I, would, I would quote two things, uh, one from Job, and he talks about that God knows, God numbers our days. He knows when we're born and he knows when it's time for us to go. And I thank God for that, 
that uh, I do not know that and uh, because it's in his hands. And from Ecclesiastes, in everything there is a season and a time for every purpose under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die. And the politicians are trying to take God out of everything. And it's demonic, it's from the enemy, and we, we stand against it and we pray against it. And even as people out there are watching this, maybe you're in a situation where you feel, I, I can't go on. The Lord will be with you. The Lord knows what's best. And I pray your blessing upon you. Amen. That's why I can't. Very true. Very true. And um, Tim, the other aspect that you want to discuss a little bit more, and this is obviously a controversial uh, topic, uh, is the whole issue of conversion therapy, which is in the King's speech. Mm. Share with us th the dangers this poses for um, mm. Christian counsellors, uh, but also pastors dealing with people that are confused about their sexual identity. Yes, so the King's Speech um, promised to bring in a draft bill on banning conversion practices. Uh, it's going to be trans-inclusive, so they want to include um, uh, counselling on transgenderism and, and gender questioning and, and gender confusion and so on. And it really means that uh, it'll end up criminalising certain types of consensual conversations. It's really infringement, a massive infringement on free speech. You know, you could want, if somebody desperately wants to have a conversation about their struggles with sexual temptations, you help them and have that conversation, you could be in prison. You know, you have a criminal record for having that conversation. Or offering to pray for somebody. So this could be a youth worker, a pastor, even a parent or a teacher or something could fall foul of this kind of thing. Um, so it, it's very, very dangerous indeed. Um, you know, the, cons the, the sort of consolation is it's a draft bill. So they're recognising in some ways the controversy of it, not proposing a bill immediately. Let's do a draft bill first and then that will either come up for consultation or have legislative, pre-legislative scrutiny, uh, which will take some time. Um, to go through. So, you know, we'll wait and see what that draft bill says when it comes out. But they've not backed down at all in this, it's in terms of being trans-inclusive and so on, and wanting to bring it in straight away in, in the Parliament um, under this King's speech. So, you know, I've written to my MP about this um, and said I'm very concerned about it and I hope they'd vote against it. And um, I would encourage other people to do that as well. And we'll wait and see what the draft bill says when it comes out and um, how, you know, how it looks, but I'm, I'm absolutely positive it will be an infringement of free speech rights and religious freedom rights as well. So Tim, could, could we actually see the case where we see pastors being arrested in this country, um, Christian counsellors being arrested? So what has happened, Simon, we already have a professional ban on conversion therapy, and what has happened a few times now is that somebody has pretended to want to have a conversation with a therapist and, and recorded that conversation and sent it off to the um, accrediting body and they've, got, they've been struck off the register of that accredited body. So this is what could happen to pastors, um, teachers, um, um, even parents. It's, it requires somebody to report it, um, unless the government's going to actually spy on people and have spies on their conversations, but it requires somebody to report it and say, this person uh, told me you know, and had a conversation with me about this, you know, and then the police will come and arrest you and say, you know, did you do this? What, you know, so yes, it's shocking, it's disturbing, and it's horrific. And I, I really hope the government backs down from it. You know, anything that is coercive and anything done physical in the name of conversion practices is already illegal anyway. I think no new laws are needed on this, and I hope. And I'm encouraged more and more people are saying that. I think when we first started talking about this five years ago, very few people were saying that. And I think now quite a lot of people are saying that, even secular groups like Sex Matters, and the Free Speech Union, and even the Cass Review was raising questions about this as well. Um, so I think there is, you know, although the government's trying to say there's widespread support for this, actually there's widespread opposition now to it as well. So all to play for on it, so and all to pray for mm. on it, and um, and all to do in terms of engaging politicians about it as well. And uh, Derek, uh, when we look at the uh, political situation with this new government, which is the most uh, secular government and administration in this country's history, isn't it important to, to realise that what's happened outside of that vacuum? So what we've seen over the last couple of decades is that dismantling of our Judeo-Christian heritage, moving Jesus out of our schools, moving Jesus out of our public square, moving out of the parliament. Uh, in a sense, we know that we would then no longer uh, be uh, under a blessing 
uh, from, from the Almighty. So share with us how important it is, despite all that, to continue to pray and intercede for our Prime Minister, his government and our newly elected members of Parliament and how it's important to let them know that we're also praying for them because the political challenges facing our members of Parliament and our Prime Minister are pretty much unprecedented. And to meet those challenges without God in, in, in the kind of natural flesh is virtually impossible. Completely agree with you, uh, Simon. Um, yes, we need to pray, pray and more pray. But when we go into Parliament, uh, we always ask the Lord, Lord, we want your encounters that you want. And we meet MPs and sometimes people that we didn't expect. And we have a little chat and then occasionally say, do you mind if we pray for you? And we pray for them. And so I think it's encounters, getting to know people, that's all part of our job. And, uh, but prayer, prayer and more prayer. Amen. And, and, and Tim, as um, Christians, how do we educate ourselves and inform us, ourselves about what's happening in Parliament and particularly how uh, legislation has an impact on um, our Christian well-being in this country, but also um, how our Christian beliefs and freedoms are being curtailed by government legislation that favours more kind of a, a, a secular outlook rather than understanding the spiritual dimensions uh, that uh, is the foundation of, uh, of Britain today. Well, um, Simon, if you go to christianconcern.com forward slash hello, you can sign up for our free weekly emails. And uh, every week uh, we put out stuff and comment on what's going on in Parliament. Um, obviously, Parliament's coming to a close. I think um, this week is the last week, isn't it, before um, re um, recess, which then starts again in September. So there won't be a lot more going on now this summer. Um, but when we start again in September, we'll be very much watching it and very much commenting on it and talking about what's happening. And we've put up articles about the King's Speech and about commission practices and so on uh, that have come up recently. So, yes, do follow up. Excellent. So, Derek and uh, Tim, thank you so much for being my guests on this week's of Politics Today. Well done for the excellent work that you do, Derek, in praying for our members of Parliament through um, prayer for uh, Parliament UK uh, and Tim we're, we're always very grateful for the very vigilant and important work being done by Christian Concern in defending our freedom so thank you so much you. and I want to thank you for watching this program at home uh, there can be no doubt that we need to be as Christians extremely vigilant uh, regarding this new uh, current government and uh, Keir Starmer we need to pray uh, for this most secular government and parliament in our history that they have an encounter with the almighty god because only then will we see our nation change only then will we see righteousness emerge in our nation so thank you for watching this week's edition of politics today